So this house was built in 1935 after the original plantation home burned down. Um, the plantation home was built in the 1830s and uh, the family, the Simpson family, this is the original Simpson, uh, Ezekiel, he actually was the one who built the original plantation home. He lived there with his wife, uh, his first and second wife, um, and together uh, with his first wife, he had three children, one surviving, um, and then his second wife, they had 12 children. <laughs> so they had quite a big family. Um, one of the 12 children was Charles Henry, he lived in the house and took care of the farm that was here. And he lived here with Anna, his wife, and three children. Uh, in 1935, it was a breezy March day, and the house burned down uh, due to Anna lighting a fire in the chimney and sparks going onto the roof. And by the time they realized the house was on fire, the roof was gone, and it was too late. Uh, but they quickly rebuilt. This was in the middle of the Great Depression. So, um, the family, like most of America, had no money. Um, it was a time where America was very, very poor, like the rest of the world. Um, so they had to quickly rebuild, but it was much, much smaller than what they were used to. Unfortunately, a few months after this house was built, Char uh, Charles Henry died, um, leaving his wife and the three children to live here, uh, leaving Anna to find ways of supporting herself um, to do that. So that's where we begin our tour of this house, is 1935 um, in the Great Depression era. So is this an exact replica of the original house? This is not a replica of the original house. Okay. The original house would have been a big mansion, plantation style house. Okay. Um, we actually have pictures of that at, that I can show you later okay. if you want. And um, when I was doing the historic village in downtown Pensacola, I think I heard of Maybe the name Simpson. Simpson, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, the Simpsons were very uh, wealthy, and mm. so they moved around in the wealthy circle okay. of Pensacola. They lived in Pensacola. They had several okay. houses in the area. Uh, they actually used that plantation home as a summer home. So that's how rich they were. Okay. They were very wealthy at that point. Um, he was one of the co-owners of the Arcadia Mill site, mm -hmm. um, and so that's why he had a home here. But his second wife did not like living in the country, mm -hmm. and she'd rather be in the city. So they spent most of their time in the city mm -hmm. rather than out here in the country. And then later he sold it to Timothy? Timothy yeah. Twitchell, there was a small portion of the land he sold okay. to him. Um, and that was before they even started um, the, the, uh, mill? the mill site. Okay. Um, and I think that was Joseph Forsyth who sold that to okay. Timothy Twitchell, not uh, Ezekiel. Okay, so. cool, awesome. Okay. Um, if you want to come in here? Yeah. So this is the master bedroom, um, and this is where uh, Anna and her husband would have lived. Um, so as I was telling you, Charles Henry died just a few months after uh, the house was built, leaving Anna to basically uh, find ways of working. So Anna came from a very wealthy, wealthy family, um, never had to work a day in her life. All of a sudden, she finds herself the sole provider for her family in a very, very poor situation. So she had to find ways of making money. Um, one of those ways she did that was teaching art. So this is some of her art over here on this wall. Uh, she worked for the WPA teaching art classes. It was a New Deal program uh, where uh, FDR put in, uh, Roosevelt put in. Um, but she also had to start selling off the land. The original land grant was about 680 mm -hmm. acres. And so over time, the land got sold off one bit by another um, and resulting in the neighborhood that we're surrounded by now. Uh, if you notice these windows right here, this can give you an idea of what the land would have looked like um, as of 1930s. It was farmland. It was you wouldn't have any houses around you to be all farmland. Um, this was Charles Henry's tuxedo. So he is a very tiny man, as you can tell. Um, but he was very wealthy, like he came from a wealthy family, the Simpson family. But you say they were in the era where the, when the, the Great Depression was, right? Yes. So he was born in 1868. Mm. Okay. So it, by the time he died, he was in he was in his later life, um, and he was quite a bit older than Anna. 
Um, Anna was a few years younger, um, so she survived until 1978. Oh, wow. Um, and he died in 1930s, like I said, so she survived him quite, for quite a bit yeah. of time. Um, so he uh, grew up in a very wealthy time for his family, um, and he lived off of that wealth. He was a very successful real estate agent, um, and so he had his own wealth, but like everyone in, in the country, he suffered greatly due to the Great Depression. So this is not a real chimney. That is a real chimney. It is? Yes. Oh. And this is how you light the fire with the sticker? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we put those there for uh, kids. So we want okay. kids to think about ways we power things. Okay. So we power things by fire, by manpower, mm -hmm. by muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, also through electricity. So we want kids to think about different ways that we would have powered things back then and even today. So. Cool beans. Yep. And the meal also hydropower. Um, Not so much. So you're asking about the mill power, uh, mill? Yeah. That was all water powered. Yes. Um, and that was before this house uh, was built and basically uh, before the original plant. It was. Um, is gone before yeah. this house was even thought of. Okay. Like it was, the mill operation ended in 1855. Oh, so okay. it ended even before Charles was born. Okay. Um, and so while this house didn't have electricity when it was mm. first built, uh, eventually it would have electricity. Mm -hmm. um, they even wired it for the electricity. So. Okay. Nico. Want to move on? Yep, totally. <laughs> Alright, so this is the living area. Um, we really wanted people to think about um, how it differs from today's living room. First of all, no TV, obviously. Um, instead, they got most of their entertainment from radios. Um, radio became very, very popular at this time. Um, and at the moment, we're uh, letting people listen to different broadcasts from the 1930s, which include fireside chats, which um, Roosevelt was one of the first uh, presidents to speak directly to the American people through the radio. Um, and that was very comforting, especially during a time when most Americans felt completely lost due to their financial situation. Um, but we also have things like a boxing match on there because that's where you got your entertainment, especially through uh, uh, sports events and things like that. Um, and then Amelia Earhart talking about science and women and a few other things. Jazz music, jazz was popular during that time. Um, but we also like to talk about uh, the family and what they managed to save over the years. So if you notice this furniture throughout here, this is actually, actually Victorian furniture from the 1800s. Uh, during the fire, they managed to save a lot of furniture. So a lot of this is from the 1800s and they managed to save it and then they continue, continue to use it um, in their home. So it kind of gives this old world feel to a house that was built not that long ago um, and despite their financial hardships they kept this furniture as well as showing um, a reminder of all the wealth that they did lose because of all the horrible tabletops and big mirrors and things like that but you also got to remember that this ha house changed how they had to live um, and they had to modify a lot of the furniture so you can tell that they had to modify that pure mirror um they had cut off the top they made this table they cut off um, some of the limbs of that table uh, to fit into the new home so uh, they really had to modify the furniture to make it fit also when they built this house they had very little money so they had to piece it together literally so these windows came from a, uh, the overseer's office uh, you can tell with this uh, ceiling with the different colored wood, mm -hmm. uh, they literally had to take pieces from different buildings and piece them together. And you can see that due to the different colors. Looking at this piano, um, so music was very important to them. And we know this because during the, uh, when the house was burning, they managed to save the upright piano that they had in the home. Unfortunately, when they were 
trying to save the house by putting water out, trying to put the fire out with water, they uh, ruined the piano by it becoming waterlogged. So Charles um, felt like he needed to give something to his daughter who was who knew how to play piano, and so he bought this for her, his daughter Suzanne. Um, so it's a 1935 uh, big grand piano, but. Um, it's one of the only new things that they put into the house, and that shows how much music was important to them. So, and it's also probably a form of entertainment, also. It, definitely, definitely. So, um, it was they had a, their own music room in the old plantation home. So we know that they did um, know how to play music. Um, most uh, educated people at that time would have known how to play some form of instrument. Charles had his own uh, violin. So he knew how to play the violin. Um, so there was a lot of people who, in the family who could uh, play instruments. Oh. Uh, this is the dining room. So one of the things that they managed to save uh, during the fire was this table. It was built in the 1830s. Um, but originally it would have 12 leaves because they're the 12 children that the family had. Um, but they didn't manage to save all of them, or if they did save them, they also got waterlogged. So you can see how it doesn't quite match up with the table itself. Um, some of the furniture may have been in storage. That's why we kind of see this mixed match of chairs surrounding the table. Um, they had to piece together what they had left over, and some of it was in storage. So if you go over here, we can talk about this first. So we'd like to show this. This is um, this was found from archaeology um, uh, from the original plantation home, um, and it is the burnt or the melting <laughs> glass, the glass jars from the basement. So it kind of shows you how hot the fire was by melting the glass jars. Um, and then we also have this for people if they want to think about what they would have saved if their house went. Like, what was the first thing that you would think of to say from your house? So. My smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you notice the silverware here, see this and mm -hmm. small pieces of here hanging on the table. So, Susan. The wife of Ezekiel, the man who owned the mill site and was quite wealthy, um, I, as I said, they had 12 children together. And every time she had a child, uh, he would send her on a shopping spree to New York and New Orleans. And she would come back with monogrammed pieces of silver. So you can actually see her name uh, monogrammed there on this platter. And they're on some of these as well over here. Um, and then some unique pieces that we have are this one right here. Um, so we found this in the rafters of the attic and it was a very big surprise to us because it looks quite damaged. Um, and we found this to be uh, Charles Henry's wife, whose name is Anna, Anna Simpson, her mother's uh, silver. So it must have been saved maybe from the fire, we're not quite sure, but it looks quite damaged from what we can tell. Yeah almost as if it was in the fire. Another thing we found in the rafters was this picture of a woman, and we don't know who she is. We tried to get the family members to tell us who, if they had any idea who it could be, but no one's come forward with a name yet, so it's still gonna be a mystery. <laughs> so it's not one of the children? We don't know. Oh, okay. We don't know. It could be. We assume it's a family member, but it could be someone else. We don't know. And here's a Victrola, so it's just like a record player that we would have today, but you'd have to crank it instead of having yeah, electricity. That's your power. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and if you wanted to get some uh, good view of these, these are some pictures from the original homestead. So that is the original house right there. You can see it was a big plantation style home. There's an etching of it there in the middle and some more pictures of the farmland um, at that time. Nice. This is the butler's pantry. 
So butler's pantries are kind of uncommon in such a small house, um, but we can kind of assume that the family wanted to keep some uh, reminder of the days old when they had the wealth and ability to have such a room. Um, so butler's pantry is usually where you keep um, your silverware and all your dining uh, equipment and everything. Uh, but today we kind of show you what um, they would do in here. So we have an ice box right here. This is probably the precursor to the modern refrigerator. Um, so what they would do is they'd have a 70 pound block of ice and you'd have an ice man come every week. You'd put it in the, uh, the ice box and at the top, you'd have a pipe that would drain the water as it melted. Um, and then as the day goes by, the cold air would sink to the bottom and the hot air would rise and that would cool everything. So it's a precursor to the modern refrigerator. And you can take a look at our pantry. So um, we like to remind people that this was a time when many people would keep a home garden and they would practice canning, home canning. Um, as a way of saving money and uh, making their own food. Um, but also, we like to remind people that this was a time when uh, processed foods became popular. So, like Jello and Girl Scout cookies and Ritz crackers and things like that. And canned food. Yeah. Canned food, yeah. Um, and uh, they would advertise these things on the radio, and people would be encouraged to buy them, even though. They were in the middle of an economic crisis. You yeah, still wanted, you still crazy. wanted your Jello. <laughs> <laughs> and got <Godiva>. iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the kitchen. So the kitchen is obviously where you prepare all of your food. Oftentimes, um, you'd have a recipe box like this one right here, and we have some of Anna's recipes on the walls over here and here. Um, but. Even though you'd have a recipe box, most of your recipes would be inside your head. Um, you wouldn't have all these little notes jotted down because you'd have to memorize them in order to cook them every day. Um, but uh, we do have a few of her recipes um, on display. And that's a real antique waffle maker. It is. It's an electric waffle maker. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. But it is a really neat looking waffle maker. <laughs> it's very fancy looking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but one thing we also like to point out, oh, this is Anna right here, um, but this is later in her life, um, mm -hmm. so she would have been, it's probably in the 60s or 70s mm -hmm. when this was taken, um, but she's still cooking her lemon tarts, she stands for her lemon tarts. Um, so over here is the wood stove. So at the time of the Depression, electric and gas stoves became more and more popular with the access mm -hmm. to that power source. But a lot of country homes still had wood burning stoves for obvious reasons of not having that power source, but also women were more comfortable still using fire gas so uh, gas so uh, not gas stoves, but fire stoves, wood stoves over these new appliances. So Anna had her own uh, wood stove. Um, it would have been extremely hot. You would have to have a chimney. Um, you'd have to be very talented in keeping the temperatures Correct in order to keep the fire burning a certain level and keeping your temperatures gauged. Um, but it's what they used, and it was an easy way of heating your house as well <clears throat> during that time. So, so in summer, they probably don't want to cook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it takes a long time to cook. Um, first of all, you have to have the wood, mm -hmm. so someone would have to go out and cut up the wood for you and everything. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have to heat it up, you have to get the fire going, and it have to heat up over time. And it was a very long process. Um, and because it was the Great Depression, you didn't have servants or anything like that. You had to do it all yourself. So appliances came more available during the 1930s, and um, housewives really enjoyed this because mm -hmm. it made cooking and cleaning much, much easier. But the more easier things got, you spent more time doing. So my favorite example would be over here with the washing machine. So this is a natural washing machine. Mm. Uh, it was gas powered. We can't, it works, but we can't use it because we don't have an exhaust pipe because that'd be extremely dangerous. <laughs> um, but washing became much more efficient with washing machines. 
So it used to be that you would wait weeks upon time to do your laundry because you didn't have a, a really good way of doing it. But when washing machines became available, uh, people realized, well, you can do washing every day. So that meant that women were spending more and more time doing laundry than they used to do. So even though they had better equipment, better uh, appliances, uh, it actually increased the amount of time they did chores. Um, and so that's one way of seeing that. Another thing is sewing machine. So a common thing back then was flower sacks or feed sacks. They would come in this very decorative um, floral and different patterns of cotton. And they did this because after you used that flower or feed, you would take those bags and you would make them into dresses and clothes that you would use on a daily basis. Um, and it was an easy way of cutting the cost down on buying new clothes and things like that. Um, so flower and feed sacks became very popular in use uh, during this time. Cool beans. And over here we talk about soap operas. So soap operas, we don't think about them um, on being a radio show, but that's where they got their original, uh, that's where their origins came from was the radio. So they get their name from soap operas because they would advertise soap on the channel. Um, and women were the ones who would be listening to these stories. And so they'd be encouraged to buy soaps and things like that. So soap operas became very, very, very popular during the time. And um, one of the soap operas was Ma Perkins. It was the longest running soap opera. It lasted almost 40 years, I believe. Wow. Yeah, it was a very long running <laughs> soap opera. Um, and it was all on radio. Uh, but the interesting thing is it was very similar to the Simpsons family's situation. So Ma Perkins was a widow who owned a lumber yard. She had three children. And one of her, even one of her sons, I believe, went off to war and died, just like Anna, who had a son who went off and died. So it was a very similar situation, so it's kind of eerie to understand that. And it, happened, it was during the 30s, that, and it talked about financial troubles and everything that we know soap operas talk about. So it was a good story to listen to as you're doing chores around the house. So, and that's the kitchen. So... If we go in here, uh, this is a multi-purpose room. Mm -hmm. So over here we talk about one of our grad students at the University of West Florida did an archaeology uh, project on the slave cabin that was here. And while this wasn't happening at the time uh, that they built this house in the 1930s, we still want to represent the enslaved population that was here uh, before the Civil War and those descendants that stayed in the area. So this was a project that the grad student did on the archaeology of one of the slave cabins that we know of on the property. Um, because after the civil war, they didn't just disappear. They were mm -hmm. still remain, so they still have to find a job and yes, oftentimes make a living. After, even after civil war, um, when all the slaves were freed, um, or the enslaved mm -hmm. were freed. Uh, they would have to stay where they were mm -hmm. because they had no options. So oftentimes you'd uh, see sharecroppers mm -hmm. popping up everywhere um, and, or doing house chores mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their old, the old mm -hmm. slave owners mm -hmm. and everything, and they'd stay in the area. Um, other times they would move away, so mm -hmm. a lot of people moved up north. Um, a lot of people moved away and found jobs mm -hmm. where they could. And it was a difficult situation for them. Mm -hmm. um, but. We do, and we don't know um, a whole lot about the enslaved population. We do know some, um, but we really wanted to uh, encourage students, especially at the University mm -hmm. of West Florida, to come out and do projects um, looking at the enslaved population here to get more information and mm -hmm. kind of honor them in finding out their history, even though we know so much about the Simpsons, but mm -hmm. we don't know much about them. Um, so, the Simpsons family tree. The Simpson family tree, yes. Um, it is very complex mm -hmm. and everything. So, I'll give you a hint of what branch we're talking about. We're looking over here. So, this is Ezekiel. 
Um, he had a brother named Andrew, who was part of the owner of the party Arcadia Mill site. Um, and their father, John, owned a mill site mm -hmm. in, uh, off of Simpson River, which was named after him. Uh, but Ezekiel had two wives, Sophia Allen and uh, Susan Uberman. And um, these are their children. And the man who lived here during the fire was Charlie, mm -hmm. and he married Anna. And from there, you have the descendants of the Simpson family that lived here on the property. And the Simpsons is related to the Pickens. Yes, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Ezekiel is the one we're talking about. Okay. His father, John, married a Pickens, mm -hmm. who was, I believe, the child yeah. of the original Pickens, um, who was the Revolutionary War hero. Yeah, that's where the Fort Pickens name after. Yes, yes. So, long and complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of Simpsons, as you can tell. And this only goes to, so Charlie's the last one we talk about here, or on a tree and everything. And he was born in 1868, mm -hmm. so... As you can imagine, in this area, there's a lot of descendants, and mm -hmm. the tree just gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> Very complicated. Very complicated. <laughs> so right here, we'd like to talk about, um, so Charles Henry knew electricity was coming to the area um, during the 1930s due to the New Deal. A lot of electricity, a lot of country uh, homes and people who lived out of the country began uh, having access to electricity that they never had before, and he knew that was coming to his area. So he had the entire house wired, even though it wasn't here mm -hmm. yet. Um, so all they had to do is really plug it in, and that was it. Um, so, and people love looking at these light switches here that kind of click on and off. <laughs> uh, this, this room right here was actually renovated over time. Like I said, um, family has lived on the property up until 2016. Uh, so at one point during this, um, time, the family expanded this room, um, and you can actually see right here, this is where it began. This used to be mm -hmm. the original room, and then you can feel it go down in a slope right here. And the reason yeah. for that is this used to be the back porch, and porches always are at an angle, mm -hmm. that way rain can go off the porch. Um, and so... That's why we have a giant slant in them. <laughs> That's the upstairs. So uh, we have a sign here telling you, showing you pictures of what it is. Um, you can read the description. Um, like the joke, that's where museum guests go to when they misbehave. Uh, but during uh, one point, mm -hmm. the descendants were living here and they had a bunch of children and they needed more space to put them um, so this is probably um, in the 60s time period and uh, so they had four boys and they needed a place to put them so they renovated the attic gave them all beds as you can see here they have a bunch of beds in there and all the boys had to live up in the attic <laughs> and now we use it at storage so it's not only for the public this room right here um, is dedicated to the history of communication. Um, and we titled this exhibit as Who Killed the Quill? Um, so it all started with this right here. Um, this is the typewriter. We found this in the rafters of the attic. Um, and it began a question of how do things change over time, communication wise. So we're talking about the quill, where you would write letters by hand in cursive and script um, to people, and it would take a long time to do. Then we go to the typewriter, um, talking about uh, typing out letters um, instead of writing them out. And then we go all the way to today's communication of text messages. <laughs> Um, but this room is um, more interactive, so we encourage guests to uh, look at it in pace. Um, That's a very s streamlined typewriter with the iPad. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we love to show this to the people and give people a chance to look at it. Looks like someone already did. <laughs> But you can take a turn on that if you want to try it out. Um, it's really fun to use. 
Uh, we also have something over there so you can practice your cursive if then anyone has forgot how to write a cursive. Um, <laughs> uh, then we also talk about um, communication during wartime. So one of the sons, Donald, he uh, was in World War II and he was over in Europe. And we're talking about communication through uh, that, the V-mail um, that served our troops. Also telegrams, so telegrams were a big thing, especially when you lost a loved one during the war because the Western Union would come in, um, visit you, uh, and everyone dreaded when that happened because they knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. So that is actually a telegram up there on the side of the wall showing um, that Donald died in action. Uh, this case right here came from Charles Henry's um, office. He was a real estate agent, and that was a map case to mm. hold all these maps. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder what those uh, the little holes are for at the bottom. I don't know. Um, if it's for map, we won't need the holes. Yeah, maybe. Uh, if they had like a, a hole in the middle of mm -hmm. something, I can mm -hmm. see it, I'm not quite sure. Alright, well, that is it. Do you okay. have any questions? Nope, thank you very much. I will go outside and check outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice right. day. You too. <laughs>
the American Civil War, a typical setup uh, for the American Civil War. We have a shelter half which is currently trying to fly away. Um, and this will be all the equipment and everything from food to daily accoutrements. Uh, so for food, you have hardtack, which is this piece of bread right here. And so it's just a piece of bread. It's just extremely hard. It's cooked until it's that hard. Um, then you would also have a meat, which they would let dry, or they would have this thing called salt pork, mm -hmm. which is straight straight out of a pig, and it lasts forever. Um, Seams will pop and degrade over time. Uh, next thing we'd also have is basic equipment to camp. Uh, for this, they have the bullets and some percussion caps. These percussion caps are filled with a little bit of mercury, which allows them to create a spark when hit. Or hit the target. And people would probably die from mercury poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th that book is actually made out of lead. So, <laughs> so a lot of people have metal poison. Sure. Yeah. Make you healthier. <laughs> so there are also some uh, soldiers would also need bandages. And as you can see, this one would have been used, and these things would be used several times throughout many battles. Uh, some bandages will be covered in dirt and mud, mm -hmm. and because they didn't know about this at that time, it was really hard for them to try. Oh, much of sanitation. Uh, there will also be stuff that the basic soldier would need, such as uh, drill manuals, and they would come in different forms or different types. We did also have these little kits which are filled with stuff to maintain the rifle. Yep. Uh, which I will pull out in Weapon a cleaning here. kit. Oh, yeah. Uh, as you can see, one of the biggest downfalls to that <laughs> is wind itself. Uh, so, uh, you say that um, the tent has two parts, right? Yes, yeah, so this tent is made out of two sections. Pop this off through a button, and this one's double button, so it's going to be a little bit trickier. But you'd pop these off, and one half would go into this little bag right here called a knapsack. The other half would go into the buddies. And the problem with these is if your buddy is killed in battle, you don't have someone to hook up with one of these tents. So you would just be blanket instead of a tent. <laughs> Be uh, going pretty rough. Uh, they'd also have things such as uh, these two types of blankets. These are called gum blankets. Um, it's G U M. And they'd be covered by tars and uh, black paint. Um, as the case for this one, it's just a cloth with black paint on it. And these would be your rain ponchos, mm -hmm. your protectors, and everything else in between. <laughs> Uh, paint it black so you can heat and it allow you to clean it easier. Uh, then you would have blankets such as a quilt and regular blankets. So this would be your main blanket for mm -hmm. uh, Confederate and Union. And it's just a regular old wool blanket. Then you'd also have quilts which would be sent from home and family members would make these extravagant things to hopefully keep you a little bit warmer at night. <laughs> Finally, uh, the soldiers equipment. I'm sorry, that 
Yeah. It's cool. So the soldier's equipment would stand would be issued a standard rifle. Uh, this one is an 1863 Springfield. It is a rifle barrel, so it has grooves inside of it. So it has rifling inside. Yes, it has some um, rifling all the mm -hmm. way down, and it can shoot accurately somewhere between 150 to 500 mm -hmm. yards. Um, this one in particular can shoot 500 yards a man-sized target. Guaranteed to at least hit that target, if nothing else. Um, this is really just a standard issue rifle, and it is a musket in the sense that it is muzzle loaded mm. and it also requires a bang over mm. here. This is where those percussion caps would go mm. on to. Uh, due to certain things, I cannot fire it <laughs> or uh, blank fire it. It's all good. equipment that soldiers would need and would wear on them, one of which is this cartridge box. This would hold standard issue 40 rounds. It has two tens inside of it. Each one of these little pockets holds 10 rounds, and then there's two on the bottom. They'd be 10 rounds of those little cartridges put into one of these. And your soldier would hopefully use all 40 in a battle and would hopefully carry extras <laughs> if he was able to carry extra rounds. Then you have the utility belt basically of the, of the standard mm -hmm. soldier. This is the bayonet. Mm -hmm. These are the triangular bayonets, mm -hmm. so they're not made for slashing. As you can see, it's for PSA. Yeah, it does not go through if yeah. you try to slash it's for stabbing. Yeah, it's just a a blunt stabbing for button. charging mostly. Yes, and it's a uh, its main use actually was never used for charging. It was mm. used for stacking arms. Okay. So they would take three rifles, put the bayonets mm. on top, and then they would form a little stack of, of them. And that would be done about five to ten times a day. The next thing on the belt would be the cap pouch, and that holds these percussion caps. As you can see, this one's a little bit different, and these would just be based on how the company that made it would work. So these ones in particular are made in Germany, mm. uh, the other ones are made from America, which is why they have green. Your standard issue equipment for the regular soldier. Uh, other than that, I have some clothing it's currently buried. <laughs> so this would be pants, and this is your Union Army trousers, the sky blues. They normally look more like that, but due to time and being out in the sun, they have faded to a lot lighter blue. And these would basically be used on both sides. Confederate and Union soldiers would wear these. Mm -hmm. um, it was just accessibility. Mm -hmm. The Confederates could loot the dead Union and take these. Um, there's also the less common um, Confederate trousers. And as you can see, they look a little bit different in how they're made too. And that's all dependent on the state. Uh, these things could have a large variety. I just don't have mm -hmm. all the different types. Uh, they don't have QA, QC back then. <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't really have a standard, this is the one and done for everything. Uh, this is also seen with jackets. As you can see, these two are actually made by the same company. They're, at, they're for the same time as a year, but as you can see, they are clearly different. Yes. And this is just all dependent on the quality of the work. So this one's a higher quality mm -hmm. one, while this mm -hmm. one is a little bit less. And it's made for the same reason. It's for summer. Down here in Florida, it's pretty much used all the time. Um, it's really just dependent on how hot it is, and it's supposed to allow for air. Then you have these. I will not lie, I don't like to wear this one in particular, 
because it is a lot shorter, but it winds up looking like a crop top once you have it on. Yeah. Uh, just because of how short the bottom mm -hmm. is. This was Confederates. I think it's a Richmond type string. I may be mistaken mm -hmm. on that. Uh, it's been a while since I've restudied this coat. And what it's, it is, is basically they just ran out. Mm -hmm. They needed more material to make mm -hmm. more jackets and it was cheaper to mm -hmm. just cut half of the material off and mm -hmm. let it become a crop top mm -hmm. than anything else. Uh, next thing is really uh, socks and other garments that they would wear. So these are the socks and the standard problem with all of them is they all wear out very quickly. They all have um, a lot of pressure on that hip mm -hmm. heel of your shoe and it allows them to wear out very quickly, almost as quickly as the shoe itself. Uh, those would also, those would typically be made by the soldiers or their families, along with these. These would be bags that they would put anything that they wanted, so hygiene equipment, uh, extra food, extra rounds, it all just depended on the soldier. Uh, and then finally, everyone needs this even in the modern day underwear <laughs> this is an old time version of underwear this is a longer version there was a shorter version mm -hmm. i once again do not have it because mm -hmm. of convenience um, but they were just made to be quick and something to block mm -hmm. you from this wool uniform Other than that, there's other duties which mm -hmm. soldiers would take on, mm -hmm. such as the sergeant duty. The sergeants may have a desk, or they may not, and they'll have to do paperwork to uh, know what's going on with the unit. So they'll have everything from morning reports to uh, weapon reports. They'll have in their book probably the names of all their men and mm -hmm. their ranks so they can go, well, this is how many people are in my company. Uh, they'll also have probably a list of orders mm -hmm. and really it just depends from there what the soldier's preference was. They could take all of this, they could take none of it, they could mm -hmm. have one or two of these items or they could have none of these mm -hmm. items. Um, when they were in large camps for days upon days, they would probably make chairs, some like this, which are just simple, pull it out, pick it back up, and move it. Or they would make some like the one right behind you, yeah. which would be these. Ooh. A little bit more extravagant, <laughs> a lot more time put into it, so more than likely used for someone in a fort or someone mm -hmm. who just was waiting all winter. Yeah, and you need screw, bow and nut for those. Looks like. Sometimes they would just not even have all that. And they take these boxes apart. They just take those little mm. nails out. They replace all the metal that you see on mm. this with just those nails and those boxes. Mm. And that's what these would be made out of typically is whatever the soldiers had lying around. Any other questions? Uh, what about your rank? What rank is that? So this is the first sergeant rank. Uh, during the Civil War, they had pretty much three ranks before getting to this, and that would be private. There would be nothing on this. A corporal, corporal is just two stripes, and then a sergeant. Uh, the sergeant would just be three stripes and a diamond. And those all had varying degrees on what they would do in the unit. Corporals were usually issued to break the platoons. Uh, sergeants would break the company and the first sergeant would be in charge of everyone going, don't do this, do this, I don't want you to do this, walk with me, come on, hold your hands, they're the babysitters of the entire unit, including the officers. Um, as many soldiers, as many people will say, war is kind of a heck. And in order to cope with this, some officers would get drunk. They would drink tons of different types of alcohol and if they didn't do that, they may just avoid talking to the unit altogether. So the first sergeant would be the bridge between those two. 
the regular enlisted man go to the first sergeant and the first sergeant would watch over the regular enlisted man as well as watch over their officers mm -hmm. make sure everything was going as well so it's to maintain the company cohesion yep cool beans all right thank you very much